Hello and welcome to another Algebra 1 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 9, Lesson 3 on Irrational Numbers. Now you've played around with a little bit with irrational numbers in both Math 7 and Math 8. But today we're going to dig into them a little bit more deeply, all right, and remind you some things that you've already learned, but also hopefully think about them in a little bit of a deeper way. So let's kind of jump right into it. Now, rational versus irrational numbers. The set of real numbers, which is basically all the numbers you know at this point, is formed by combining two very different types of numbers, rational numbers and irrational numbers. Now, we looked at rational numbers a few days ago, but um, let's, let's kind of revisit it now. A rational number is any number that can be written as the ratio of two integers. Such numbers include 3 fourths, negative 7 thirds, 5 firsts if you want, or 5 over 1, right? The numbers have terminating or repeating decimals. Now an irrational number, believe it or not, has a very simple definition. An irrational number is any number that's not rational. Now, at the end of the day, that is probably not the definition that will stick in your mind, but that is truly the definition. You have rational numbers, numbers that can be written as the ratio of two integers, and then you've got irrational numbers, which are numbers that cannot be written as the ratio of two integers. It's really that simple. Now, these numbers have non-terminating and non-repeating decimal representations, which is what most students remember and think an irrational number is. But that's kind of like, like the difference between knowing what a particular animal is and the way it looks. The way an irrational number looks is it looks like a number that has a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal. But what it really is is a number that can't be written as a fraction involving two integers. And that's pretty important. So let's take a look at exercise number one. Consider a number that is rational and one that is irrational, i.e. not rational. Consider the rational number two-thirds and the irrational number square root of one-half. Both of these numbers are less than one. Letter A, draw a pictorial representation of two-thirds on the rectangle shown below. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So this is literally take me back to like second grade, all right? Why don't you go ahead and draw a pictorial represent representation of the number two-thirds on the rectangle shown below, this rectangle, assuming that this rectangle represents the number one. Pause the video and go ahead and do that. All right. Well, I mean, the whole point of two-thirds, right, is that you've taken the quantity one, You've broken it up into three equal parts, and you have two of them, right? So I take this thing, and I can, you know, maybe use dashed lines like this. And this is two-thirds, right? And that, that was the brilliance of fractions in the first place. The idea that we could take a whole number, specifically the number one, break it up into a certain number of parts, and then count how many of those parts we have. So, you know, if I have um, a screw that is five twelfths of an inch in diameter, that means I'm gonna take the inch, I'm gonna break it up into 12 equal parts, and five of them, of those 12 parts, is how big that screw diameter is, five twelfths, right? Two thirds. Now, letter B, using your calculator, give the decimal representation of the number two thirds. We'll break out our calculator in just a moment, but why don't you go ahead and do this on your own? All right, well what you should have found is that two-thirds is one of those rational numbers that has a repeating decimal. Specifically, it has the decimal 0 0.6 repeated, right? 0.6666666666 forever. All right, now let's take a look at letter C. Write out all of the decimal places that your calculator gives you for the square root of one half. Notice that it does not have a repeating decimal pattern. All right, well this one we've got to pull the calculator out for because I certainly don't have this memorized. Now, we talked about this a few lessons ago, but it's very important when you're doing this work, right, to be able to have every decimal show up on your calculator that it can possibly show up. On the TI Inspire, that means I'm gonna go into my document, I'm going to go down to my settings, 
and my document settings, and I'm going to make sure that the number of display digits is set equal to the maximum number it can, which is 12. I want to see all 12 digits. I don't want to think that a number actually has a terminating decimal when it really doesn't. So if your calculator isn't set to show you as many decimals as possible, right, make sure that you pause the video now and figure out how to make that happen. Again, on the TI Inspire, you go into the document, you go into settings and the document settings, and the first thing that you see is the number of digits your calculator is gonna show me, which is gonna be 12, all right? So now if I want the square root of 1 half, I'll go to the control square root. I'll even use the fraction button this time, although I could certainly do the square root of 1 divided by 2, but I'll have the square root of 1 half and hit enter, right? Point 707106781877, right? There is no repeating decimal pattern here whatsoever. Now, I don't know that I'm gonna write down every one of those digits, uh, but maybe I will. All depends if I can kinda keep this up. I'm gonna do handheld only so I can keep this in front. And that's going to be, I know it's way too small for you to see now, but 0.707106781187. Now you might say to yourself, well, my, my calculator isn't showing me that many digits. Well, again, that could be because you have a different calculator. It could be because you have the number of decimal digits being shown to be different than mine. The important thing here is that there is no repeating pattern, right, in this, okay? Now, Letter D, very important. Why could you not draw a pictorial representation of square root of one half the way you do for two thirds? Okay. And again, this is, this is really amazing. People didn't even know irrational numbers existed for the longest time because it kind of makes sense that no matter how small or large of a quantity you have, you could always just take the number one subdivide it into a certain number of, you know, subdivisions, and then take a certain number of those. But, right, since square root of one half is not rational, it cannot be written as the ratio of two integers, right? And that's really why we can't write the pictorial representation, right? If the square root of one half, you know, could be written as the ratio of two integers, let's say it could be written as 71 one hundredths, right? Let's just say it could be written as 71 one hundredths, right? Well, then you could take you know, a, a rectangle that represents the number one. You could divide it into 100 equal parts and then you could shade 71 of them. But you can't do that with an irrational number because it can't be written as the ratio of two integers. So there's no way to divide up a whole into a certain number of parts and then take some of those parts to represent the number you're talking about. And that just really boggled a lot of people's minds when they first realized that these numbers existed because it always seemed like, oh, it doesn't matter what the number is. As long as I figure out how many you know, parts I have to divide the whole up into, eventually, if I divide the whole up into small enough parts, right, then I can find a fraction that is equal to whatever this number is. But there is no fraction involving only integers that's equal to the square root of one half. There is none. Now, don't get me wrong, at the end of the day, what most students learn about irrational numbers is that they've got a non-repeating, non-terminating decimal representation. And that is important because you wanna be able to recognize one when you see one. Now, irrational numbers are important because without them, our real number line would have gaps. You know, we'd have these rational numbers, but then we'd have all these holes where there are irrational numbers. In essence, they are numbers that cannot be found by subdividing a whole into an integer number of parts, which is what I was just going off on for like 10 minutes. There are many types of irrational numbers, but square roots of non-perfect squares are always irrational, all right? So anytime you take the square root of a non-perfect square, the result is always an irrational number. So let's kind of 
Let's take a look at that a little bit with our calculators. Exercise number two. Write out every decimal your calculator gives you for these irrational numbers and notice that they never repeat. Okay, great. Should be simple enough, it's just calculator work. Why don't you figure out what the square root of two, square root of 10, square root of 23 is in terms of a decimal, all right? Write out however many decimals your calculator gives you. Mine's gonna give me 12, all right? And then we'll revisit it. Take a couple moments to do that. All right, square root of two. Here we go. I'm gonna keep it on the small version because I am gonna be writing out the answers here, but the square root of two, all right, is 1.414213562237. And again, don't get me wrong, that thing keeps going and going and going and going. Okay, irrational numbers, their decimal representations didn't stop here at the seven, okay? This thing's gonna go on to infinity. Okay, it's just gonna keep going and it's never gonna repeat its pattern. All right, let's take a look at the square root of 10. All right, square root of 10 is, again, kind of an ugly number. It's 3.162277666017. Now, don't get me wrong, the square root of 10's got some cool repetition going on in it, right? Two twos, two sevens, two sixes, et cetera. But at the end of the day, right, there's no overall pattern that's repeating. And finally, the square root of 23. Again, any non-perfect square underneath there, we are gonna get a decimal that will just keep going forever. 4.79583152331. Gets a little bit silly. Now, every time an irrational number like these ever gets used in a real calculation, a real world setting, right? Yeah, at some point you round the number, right? Because you can't use every digit. If you used every digit, you would be doing that problem forever because the decimals go on forever. So in every practical application, we truly are using a rational number that approximates the irrational number that we're talking about but these numbers are all irrational, which just by itself is kind of interesting. All right, now rational numbers and irrational numbers often mix in calculations. You might add them or multiply them or whatnot. One example, one good example, is when we simplify the square root of a non-perfect square, which we did in the last lesson. So if you haven't seen how to do that yet, what's coming might be a little bit confusing. So let's, let's kind of play around with it a little bit. Exercise number three. Consider the irrational number square root of 28. Letter A, without using your calculator, between what two consecutive integers will this number lie and why? All right, I want you to think about this. Without using your calculator, I should be able to say, oh, the square root of 28 lies between nine and 10 or between you know, um, 13 and 14 or something like that. So I'd like you to think a little bit, what two consecutive integers, one right after another, this number must lie in between? Pause the video now and see if you can figure that out. Well, it's pretty cool, right? It must lie between five and six now. Why must it lie between five and six? Well, because the square root of 25 is equal to five, the square root of 36 is equal to six, and the square root of 28 must be less than the square root of 36, but must be greater than the square root of 25, right? So that thing's gotta lie somewhere in between, okay? Now, letter B, simple enough. Using your calculator, write out all decimals for the square root of 28. All right, great. Why don't you pause the video for a moment and write out all decimals for the square root of 28 that your calculator gives you. All right, well, they should be non-terminating, non-repeating, etc. Simple enough, square root of 28, teeny, teeny, tiny on the screen. I'm getting 5.291502639. Two, two, one, three. Make that decimal place a little bit bigger. And as we see, right, 
that number <laughs> lies between 5 and 6. Simple enough, right? Now, from our last lesson, letter C. Write the square root of 28 in simplest radical form. All right, well, see if you remember how to do that. Go ahead and simplify the square root of 28. Well, remember, to simplify a square root, what we do is we look for the largest perfect square that divides into the radicand. The radicand is a fancy name for the number underneath the square root. So the largest number that divides into the radicand of 28 is the number 4, right? So I can rewrite the square root of 28 as the square root of 4 times the square root of 7, right? 4 times 7 is 28. And then I take the square root of what I can and leave the square root of what I can't. So the square root of 28 in simplified form is 2 times the square root of 7. Now letter D, write out the decimal representation from your answer from C. Notice it is the same as B. <laughs> All right, we already know what the answer is going to be. It's going to be that. But what I'd like you to do is put in 2 times the square root of 7 into your calculator and see what you get. All right, I'd like to make this one show up on the big screen. So just for a moment, I'm going to exit out of this, bring this thing up, put it on my larger screen, right? Remember, we simplified the square root of 28 as 2 times the square root of 7, enter, and notice we get exactly the same number, right? 5.2915, etc. Okay, and that makes sense, right? When we simplify a number, Right? We don't want its value to change. We're just changing the way the number looks. Like when I simplify the, the, uh, the fraction 6 eighths and I make it into 3 quarters, right? Well, those two numbers, 6 eighths and 3 quarters, are the same number. They're 0 0.75, okay? So I don't want the number to actually change, and it gives me the same number. Well, that's not what we want. Let's make that a little bit bigger and bring it down here. So we get... 5.29150262213. Now before we move on, let me make sort of the point of this. In this situation, the number 2 is a rational number, and the number square root of 7 is an irrational number, right? So here's a situation where we have a rational number multiplying an irrational number, and our result is an irrational number. So one of the main things that we want you to know about the way rationals and irrational numbers sort of mix is that when you multiply an irrational number by a rational number, you get an irrational number. From the last exercise, we can see that a rational number times an irrational number gives us an irrational number. That's assuming that the rational number isn't zero. In other words, if I had zero times the square root of two, I would have zero which is a rational number. It's, it's small, but it's a rational number. But anything else, if I take 8, a rational number, and I multiply it by the square root of 15, which is an irrational number, I'll get an irrational number. And it kind of makes sense, right? If I took a, a decimal pattern that never repeated, right, and never terminated, and I multiplied it by a nice number, right, then it kind of makes sense that I'm going to get again a number with a decimal version that never repeats and never terminates. Now we want to play around with some other ways that they can interact. So let's take a look at exercise number four. For each of the following addition or subtraction problems, a rational number has been added to an irrational number. Write out the decimal representation that your calculator gives you and classify the results as rational, if it has a repeating decimal, or irrational, if it doesn't. All right, so I'd like you to use your calculators and figure out what 1 half plus square root of 2 is, what 4 thirds plus the square root of 10 is, what 7 minus the square root of 8 is, write out all the decimal places you possibly can, then classify your result as being either rational or irrational based on the way the decimal looks. Pause the video now and see what you get. All right, let's do it. Um, oh, I got to get my calculator back. Um, otherwise, I won't be able to do this. Let me go back to the handhold only so that we can keep it in front. Go back to the full screen view and let's do one half. I'll even use my fraction bar. One half plus the square root of two. 
Whoops, that didn't work. Plus the square root of two, there it is. All right, one half plus the square root of two, very small on the screen, I understand. That's going to be 1.914213567. Whoops, five, six, two, three, seven. All right. I see absolutely no repeating pattern here whatsoever. So it looks like this is an irrational number. All right, an irrational number. Let's do four thirds plus root 10. See what we get. Four thirds, nice rational number, plus the square root of 10, nice irrational number, gives me 4.4956109935. Again, a little tricky, but I look at that. I don't see anything that's terminating, I don't see anything that's repeating. So, Again, an irrational number. All right, let's do that final one. Seven minus the square root of eight. Nice rational minus an irrational gives me 4.1715728752527525. Again, I see a decimal that seems to be going on forever with no discernible pattern repeating, and therefore I'm going to say irrational. So what does it seem like? Exercise number five, fill in the following statement about the sum of rational and irrational numbers. Shouldn't say or there, it should say of the sum of rational and irrational numbers. When a rational number is added to an irrational number, the result is always irrational. All right, and the, the, the same is also true about subtracting, because of course any subtraction problem can be turned into an addition problem of opposites. We can say this is the same for subtraction. Whenever we add or subtract a rational number to an irrational number, we get an irrational number. And again, you can kind of think about it in terms of these patterns, right? If I had a decimal pattern, right, that never terminated and never repeated, and I added it to one, let's say, that terminated, then you would certainly, like, eventually you'd have all these zeros that were being added to this, like, like this, this non-repeating pattern, so that's, that's not gonna repeat, right? Um, then if you had one where, let's say, the pattern did repeat, right, adding to a pattern that doesn't repeat, Right? It kind of makes sense that you wouldn't suddenly get a pattern that repeats. Okay, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And this one's probably the most important of them all. Right? When I add or subtract a rational and an irrational to one another, I always get an irrational number. Okay? Let's take a look at one final problem. Exercise number six. Which of the following is an irrational number? If necessary, play around with your calculator to see if the decimal representation does not repeat. Don't be fooled by the square roots. All right, so I'd like you to try to think about this problem without using your calculator, okay? But if you absolutely have to, feel free. Pause the video now. All right, well, it's pretty simple. Choice four is our answer. Why? Because the number three is rational and the square root of six is irrational. So a rational number plus an irrational number is an irrational number. Now you might say, but wait a second, what about four minus the square root of nine? Well, four is certainly rational, but so is the square root of nine. The square root of nine is just equal to three. Choice two is equal to the number one, right? Four minus three, it's just equal to one. You know, what about the square root of 25? Well, but the square root of 25 is again a rational number, it's equal to five, right? And three sevenths literally just is the ratio of two integers. It is definitely a rational number. Now again, if you didn't know any of this, but all you knew was that irrational numbers have decimal representations that never terminate, never repeat, then you could actually go through and, you know, just figure out what three plus the square root of six is. 
One of the problems though is that the number three sevenths, right? The number three sevenths, if you put it into your calculator, and actually I need to do this on the big screen so you can really see it, right? The number three sevenths, let me clear this real quick. The number three sevenths, when you look at it, you know, especially, especially if you've got your calculator with reduced numbers of decimals showing, you might not even see the repeating pattern because it takes a while, but it does repeat. It's 0 0.4287, sorry, 0 0.4285714285714285. 142857, Etc. right? So one seventh is actually a fraction and any fraction with a denominator of seven is a fraction will, that will actually take a while before it repeats. So it can be kind of a challenge to even see that. I mean, you might put this in and go, well, that's, that's an irrational number. But by definition, three sevenths is a rational number because it's the ratio of two integers, right? So all by itself, it's gotta, it's gotta be rational. All right, so let's, let's wrap this up. All right. Today, we kind of dug into irrational numbers a bit. And at its essence, what I really, really hope you come out of it with is that irrational numbers are simply numbers that aren't rational, right? They aren't numbers that can be written as fractions, right, of an integer divided by an integer, right? There are numbers out there like that, right? And you've learned some of them. Numbers like the number pi, right, that's used to calculate the circumference and area of a circle, that's an irrational number. The only other types of irrational numbers you know are square roots of non-perfect squares, and every single one of those is irrational. Now, why is that? Well, that's something that's going to have to wait until maybe even college-level mathematics before you prove that non-perfect squares are irrational, and it's actually not the easiest thing to prove, but in this level, you just have to know that fact. We also looked a little bit at how rational numbers and irrational numbers can interact. Specifically, when I take a rational number and multiply it by an irrational number, I get an irrational. And when I add a rational to an irrational, I get an irrational number. And again, we'll see that kind of come up here and there. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another Algebra 1 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.